Um, can I welcome you to the Royal Society of Edinburgh? My name is David Edward. I was the international convener of the uh, society until recently. Just before going on to the uh, talk, can I mention some of the RSE's international activities? Uh, the society supports a wide range of activities uh, which enhance Scotland's involvement in global co collaboration. For example, exchange programs between existing researchers in different countries, early stage researchers who can benefit by going to another country to experience research activities there, uh, letting people know what is going on in the field of research and innovation in Scotland, stimulating collaboration between centres of excellence and providing a forum for discussion. And I may say that some of us were uh, at the end of last week in Krakow to uh, sign a memorandum of understanding with the uh, Polish Academy of Arts and Sciences. Now this lecture is called the McCormick Lecture. The late Sir Neil McCormick was Regius Professor of Public Law in the University of Edinburgh for many years and was a member of the European Parliament for five years. Sadly, he died in uh, 2009, but he was, during his lifetime, both an astonishingly uh, wide-ranging scholar with many, many interests, and he made a great mark in Scotland, in the United Kingdom generally, and in many, many European countries. He was a passionate European, a supporter of what he had hoped would become Europe of the, nation, of the regions, but he was also a member of the Giscard d'Estaing Commission, which drew up the uh, ill-fated European uh, Constitution, which he actually supported and wrote in favor of. He believed in Europe as a civilizing influence, and he felt that Scotland's future lay in close partnership within the European Union. He was, as it's been said, a passionate gradualist. So when he died, the society had uh, had for some years a European lecture, and it was decided with his agreement and with his wife's agreement that the lecture should be renamed the McCormick European Lecture. Today is not, after all, a lecture, but a discussion. Our guest is Mary McAleese, a former president of Ireland. But just in order not to go through it piece by piece in the discussion, let me say something about her CV, so to speak. She uh, was born and brought up in Belfast, was educated at Queen's University Belfast and then Trinity College Dublin. She was called to the Bar of Northern Ireland in 1974 and of King's Inns Dublin in 1978 and practiced as a barrister in Northern Ireland from 1974 to 1975 when she became Reed Professor of Criminal Law, Criminology and Penology at Trinity College Dublin. In a short interlude of that professorship, she uh, took up life as a journalist and TV presenter in Radio Telefisern. And she continued with that part-time when she went back to her work as professor in Trinity College. And then she changed direction again and became director of the Institute of Professional Legal Studies at Queen's University Belfast, a position she held from 1987 to 1997. She was the first 
Lady Pro Vice Chancellor of Queen's University Belfast and is a Professor Emerita of that university. She uh, had directorships in Northern, uh, North, the Electricity Company of Northern Ireland, in Channel 4, and the Royal Hospital Trust of Belfast. But then she became President of Ireland and served as President of Ireland for 14 years, 14 years stretching, really, between two notable events, the Good Friday Agreement and the visit of the Queen to Ireland. Having demitted office in 2011, what did she do? She went to Rome to study canon law and graduated as a licentiate in canon law in 2013. That's this year, I think, or last, last, year. last year, sorry. And is now studying for a doctorate in canon law, focusing on the position of children in canon law. So without more ado, can I introduce uh, President McAleese and ask her some questions which will perhaps stimulate some more from you. Well, welcome, Mary. We've had some discussions before, but could I begin by asking just to tell us a little about your childhood in Belfast. I think you were born and brought up in Belfast, lived in the Ardoin district, lived on the Protestant side of the division, but your father worked on the Catholic side of the division. Hmm. That's a pretty good description. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, David, and thank you for asking me, and thank you all for being here, and to be gathered here in Neil's name as well, in Neil McCormick's name, I find... Um, very poignant, particularly as you're coming up to your own referendum, uh, which he would surely, I think, love to have been part of. Um, I'm not going to be part of it. But, um, um, but yes, I was born, born in Belfast um, in the post-war years, post-Second World War years, um, and lived and grew up in a place called Ardoin that many of you who follow the Troubles in Northern Ireland will know is still to this day a flashpoint area. Um, it is, at the moment, the scene of what is being called the, more, the most contemporary manifestation of community difficulties, which is the flag protest. Uh, that's just going on right at this moment at my front door, uh, my old front door. Um, and um, it is regarded, I think, by people who uh, put boxes and shapes on things as a Catholic enclave, in fact, in reality, it's the reality, as always, is more complex than that. Uh, once, if you look at the demography of that area um, and the history of it, um, it's a, there's a main road. Uh, the main road to the airport from the city centre goes right up through an old mill village, an old linen mill village, which is Ardoin. And little small streets of little mill houses go off on either side. And what used to happen was every 25 years or so there would be a pogrom against, generally against the Catholics in that area and what would happen and sectarian tensions would break out and people would scatter um, to both sides of the road. So you'd have a Protestant side and a Catholic side. Then they would get sense and things would calm down and the natural inclination we have to befriend one another and to be neighbourly with our neighbours would ensure that there would be a bit of mixing. People would, these were all rented houses, so it was easier in those days to move across the divide when things calmed down. And um, my, my parents moved to the other side, uh, to the Protestant side of the divide when I was young. I was about a year old. And that's essentially where I grew up. Um, of course, nowadays, with people with a huge increase in home ownership, um, ironically, um, not to mention the troubles. Um, that, that this, like most of Northern Ireland, is now uh, completely ghettoised. And as we know, 93% of all people who live in Northern Ireland live in areas that are, that are either Catholic or Protestant, to use those very loose terms. And they are very loose terms nowadays. 
Um, but that's where I grew up. So I grew up, in a, I grew up as a Catholic in a Protestant area, surrounded by Protestant friends. It was perfectly natural for me to meander into the local Presbyterian church. I knew my Presbyterian minister as well as I knew my Catholic priests. Um, that was that, and I'm always very grateful, grateful for growing up aware of the sectarian undercurrents because in my street there were families whose children were not allowed to play with us because we were Catholic. Um, so an awareness that we inhabited a world you know, where the Reformation and Counter-Reformation politics had yet to be fully resolved. <laughs> and I think uh, people speak of the Troubles as starting in the 1960s, but would you like to say something about whether that was a completely new development or something which was uh, a resurgence or a breaking out of something which was lying dormant? I think it was a new phase of an old problem um, and um, a different shape on the phase, yes, from other previous um, manifestations of it. But if you look at Irish history, uh, we know that um, it has been characterised by um, resentment and resistance to the forces of colonisation and uh, plantation. And that has happened over a period of centuries. Uh, we had, um, in the 20th century, we had the rising in 1916, um, uh, which ultimately, of course, led to a war of independence and then the partitioning of Ireland for the first time in its history. Although it had been under British uh, dominion or British colonization, it had been administered as one entity. And then we had partition. And from partition, there was always ongoing resentment expressed in a culture of paramilitary violence. And that had died down somewhat in the 1950s. Um, um, but in the 19, and indeed in the early 1960s, it looked as if, um, as the population was becoming more educated post, of course, the Butler Acts, and you now had um, um, cohorts of educated Catholics, cohorts of educated Protestants, um, talking, beginning to talk a different kind of language, um, the engagement between the, the governments in Dublin and Belfast, softening, uh, growing slightly warmer, but that was a red rag to certain sectarian bulls. And um, we had then the resurgence of sort of sectarian language, mostly at that time generated, I'd say, by Paisleyism in the early 1960s. Um, that fearfulness, that still that very strong fearfulness of a Catholic Republic, the idea of a United Ireland, the fear that that was still lurking there, um, whipped up. Um, and um, of course, as always, there were, um, there were um, commemorative events around which these things began to become more difficult. 1966 being, um, of course, the year of the 50th anniversary of the Somme, but also the 50th anniversary of the Rising. And as these things converged and two separate sets of commemorations um, uh, took place, sectarian tensions arose again. And then we had, of course, at the same time, running in parallel with that, um, what Seamus Heaney, um, God rest him, described in a magnificent poem from the Canton of Expectation, you had what he called intelligences brightened and unmannerly as crowbars. Now at work in the body politic, and really what he was describing were the first wave of, uh, of young people who belonged to a massified um, third level education system. Up until the 1940s, 1950s, third level education, essentially a feature of and for an elite. Then come the Butler Act, then come the New Education Act in Northern Ireland, which is shortly after the Butler Act. And now you had, as he said, heads that, lie, that might have dozed a life away against the flanks of milking cows. <laughs> they were doing other things now. They were going to universities, they were going to colleges, they were getting qualifications. And then, of course, they were coming up against all the obstacles that stood in the way of, um, because they were this religion, just as in other jurisdictions, because they were that color. Um, so you had the growth of a civil rights movement, as you had in America, as you had in other parts of Europe. And um, that then, the, the tide of sectarianism, um, 
that had created this Protestant Parliament in Northern Ireland, this uh, Catholic state in the Republic, um, which could never really sustain. You know, these were uh, they were not the kind of places that people could inhabit in perpetuity because they were they were both dysfunctional in their shape and in their nature of their nature. Um, that started to get played out on the streets, regrettably, and um, I think largely because the Unionist government of the time, it is now well known, reacted poorly to the calls for um, civil rights. Then we had the growth of, not the growth, but actually the, uh, essentially the, the rebirth of um, uh, paramilitarism, which had never really gone away, in fairness. It had been reduced to embers, but that's all. You know, it was only waiting for somebody to throw a drop of oil on it, and it was going to fan to a flame again, and that's what it did from '69 right the way through to um, 1998. Still little embers of it. It's gone back down to embers again, and maybe quite soon, hopefully, will be reduced to ash. But that's that's where it is. So I grew up in the night from 1969, the year I started university. Um, and I wanted to become a lawyer, and I was a, uh, my great hero um, was Daniel O'Connell, uh, the great liberator and um, uh, generator of, not just of Catholic emancipation, but the champion of American slaves, of Russian Jews, of anywhere where people were held in contempt by, uh, by powerful elites, he was their champion. Kind of a Mandela-like character, I think, in his era, back in the early 19th century. And he was my hero, and I, like him, I wanted to be a lawyer though I also think that I was heavily influenced by Perry Mason, and um, so, as well. And um, so, um, uh, when I came back the night that I got into university, the night that I knew I was getting into the university, the first of my family, my parents both had left school, one at 14, one at 15, uh, they belonged regrettably to that, you know, that era, as many of your parents probably did before, they, before education became free and widely available. Um, so I arrived home that night having celebrated getting into university, came back to my parish to find the B Specials who were a, um, a they were a, a, an auxiliary police force, I mean a legitimate auxiliary police force, part of the forces of law and order, uh, but like the RUC at the time, like the Royal Ulster Constabulary, uh, they were largely drawn from the Protestant population and saw themselves not as a community kind of police service, but as a service that was designed to protect the constitutional status of the country, um, which meant that most of them, regrettably, came from one side of the community and saw themselves, in a sense, at odds with the other side of the community that I belong to. And I saw them. I, I wasn't able to get home properly that night because they were in the parish that I lived in and I watched as they had the Catholic houses pointed out to them and torched them. And that was a very seminal moment for me because I was confronted with the same dilemma that Daniel O'Connell had faced in his time. What do you do in these circumstances? Does your anger and your and your natural anger and resentment draw you down the line of the culturally um, embedded paramilitarism, um, or does it draw you away from that into the dialogue and the use, the patient use of democracy? And I chose the latter, thankfully, and I was very fortunate that I had parents who wouldn't have let me choose the former anyway. Um, so that was, because other friends of mine made different choices. Uh, one girl I went to school with, um, whose name is probably well known to you, she died this year, Dolores, uh, she was just known popularly here, I think, as Dolores Price. I knew her at school as Dolores Price, and that's possibly our bad pronunciation. Um, but um, she, of course, joined the IRA and spent a considerable amount of her young life, her young adult life, in prison. So different choices. And there, but for the grace of God, I've always said, go, I. So your choice was university and particularly law? Law. And particularly criminal law at well, that stage? Not necessarily. Uh, I mean, I, I always enjoyed criminal law because uh, I saw a lot of it in action around me. Um, and, but 
No, I th criminal law really ended up almost being just an accident. I've always found criminal law more interesting. Property law drove me insane. It was one of those things that responded very well to my grandmother's well rehearsed axiom, you don't have to enjoy it, you just have to do it. <laughs> um, so, and I find lots of parts of law were rather like that. I didn't have to like them, I just had to endure them and get through them. But I liked criminal law and I liked constitutional law, I liked structure. And actually criminal law too is about structure at the end of the day. It's about putting shape on life and bringing people to heel and making sure that, you know, that there is some realm of justice. So I was always drawn to it, but more importantly, I got a job in it. So it be, I, I kind of made it my life because Trinity offered me a job teaching it. So um, jobs being a precious commodity, I was very happy to make criminal law my career. You've spoken about Trinity and you went to Trinity to study before you were called to the bar. And did you find a difference in that? You must have found a difference between Dublin and Belfast. Just a slight one. <laughs> Actually a monumental difference, if the truth be told. Um, I knew Dublin well because my brother had been at school there so, and I had relatives who lived there. So, um, No, that's not true. I thought I knew Dublin well. That's a different proposition. I thought I knew it well. And, of course, living in Belfast, um, you know, as a Catholic, against the backdrop, you know, of living in a Protestant state for a Protestant people, the Republic was the place that I thought, you know, was the place where my soul would be free and I would be fully understood. What a mistake that was. Um, so, you know, I get to Dublin and discover that nobody there gives a toss, really, um, about the North, basically. And, more, and even less do they understand it. And I began then, at that stage, to probe my own understanding of the place I had come from and the island I inhabited and to start to challenge some of my own presumptions um, about it. Um, uh, because really we were, you know, we were, we were, though we didn't really realise it, but we were moving through a kind of a catharsis um, where a lot of the accepted ways of looking, uh, the, historically, the historically embedded and historically, um, uh, the, the legacy of history, had to be looked at afresh. And living in Dublin opened me up to a, a reality that I always assumed living in Belfast that we had this wonderful spine in Dublin that we could rely on to help us in all circumstances. And then I realized, actually, no, you help yourself. And you have to make, you know, you have to make the best of things um, where you're at. So, Dublin was a revelation for me. Also, of course, my father was from the west of Ireland, from Roscommon, and I spent a lot of time there, and I also realised very quickly that Dublin was not the rest of Ireland, and that Dublin 4, in particular, um, was not the rest of Ireland. Um, so I started to begin to get a feel for the complexity of the world that I'd inhabited, um, and the lies that we told about history and the way in which we used history uh, on all sides, how we ransacked history um, and, and drew out from history the ammunition that we used to support our own worldview, no matter how skewed and self-serving it was. And we ransacked it for evidence of, of the, you know, the depravity of the other, of the, you know, the, the lack of faith, of the other, the lack of integrity of the other. And no better way, no better example of that than the way in which we handled the First World War. When I grew up in Belfast, the, I mean, the only Protestants went to the Cenotaph on the 11th of the 11th. Why? Well, because only Protestants had first fought in the First World War. They were the only people who responded to the call you know, of, uh, and the, the, the bid for freedom of small countries. And um, the perfidious Irish um, in the Republic and elsewhere, and Catholics basically read for Irish Catholics, um, they had a rebellion against Britain in 1916. And um, that, was the, that was the received wisdom on the one hand. On the Catholic side, they were quite happy with that narrative um, uh, because they rose up against um, uh, British rule and British colonialism. Um, and um, in truth, of course, the truth of the matter is 250,000 out of a population of less than 3 million volunteered 
because there was no conscription in Ireland. 250,000 volunteered during that First World War, of whom 50,000 did not come home. And a lot came home troubled, damaged, injured, and all the rest of it. Who were they? For the most part, the vast majority of them were Irish Catholics. They were Irish nationalists. They arrived home in the middle of the 1916 rebellion, or they arrived home at the end of the war to discover the world had changed in Ireland, meanwhile. The real heroes were now the heroes of the Rising, who had not been the heroes during the Rising, but were now were the heroes. And because, indeed, of how Britain had handled their, their had rather brutally handled their deaths. And so they arrive back, and they are regarded as social pariahs, even though many of them had joined up because they believed that Britain, if they joined up, they believed John Redmond's story that that they would be given self-government, they'd be given devolved government as a gift, as a prize for their fidelity. They arrive back and nobody wants to know them. And their stories were put, as somebody described to me, in shoeboxes in the attic. And my husband and I, when we went into office, when I went into office in 1997 as president, one of the things that we were very conscious that we needed to do was to assist those people who, against the run of history, or at least the run of edited history, had been trying to draw that story back into public consciousness, the story, the true story of the First World War, to offer it as a common platform, a platform of common commemoration, where Catholics and Protestants could stand at cenotaphs all over Ireland and commemorate their shared dead. We hadn't done that. Protestants went to cenotaphs, Catholics, by and large, didn't. So now we've arrived at a situation, it's now 2013, where we have the Peace Tower in Messine, which Her Majesty the Queen and I jointly opened with the King of Belgium in 1998. Um, and we have the Memorial at Island Bridge, uh, which we've had for, since the end of the second, since the, indeed, since going, going right back into the history of the World Wars, we've had that. But we've now restored it to the memory of the joint memories of Catholics, Protestants, Irish men, Northern Irish men, British Irish, who served together, died together, soldiered together. And it's taken the best part of 100 years to really do honour and justice to their memory because we, you know, we took scissors to the story and we used it regrettably. Regrettably, we used it to divide rather than to join. You, while you were professing criminal law in Trinity College, Dublin, you took time out to be a TV journalist and a presenter. What, what led you to that and what did you get out of it? That was, it actually goes back to this business of arriving in Dublin thinking that I knew the place and thinking that I, it would be my comfortable spiritual home and discovering that I was a complete ignoramus um, and that I really didn't know this place. And so when I got the opportunity to become a current affairs journalist, I thought this was a kind of a shortcut to trying to get under the skin of the place that I was inhabiting. And, to, and, and it was, to some extent, there isn't any doubt that um, that... that that being for two years uh, full-time and for the next five years or part-time a current affairs journalist, um, it really did give me a very broad insight. Um, I travelled Ireland very widely, um, picking up on all the issues um, that were the issues of the day and discovering you know, the, the difference in attitudes to, in, between Cork and Dublin, um, the difference in attitudes between Athlone and Roscommon and... Um, getting, and the difference in attitudes between Kerry and Donegal and beginning really to um, just to open up, to unpack this country that, you know, that I felt deeply, deeply um, attached to without fully really understanding its nature and its identity and also very aware that I had been fed, as all of us had been, indeed all of us are, one way or another, being fed a view of history that was designed to keep me, if you like, in a particular box and with a particular perspective and with a particular set of ambitions and views. Um, and in a way, I just started the journey to kind of, you know, wrestle, wrestle myself kind of out of those as much, not so much out of them, but to wrestle, to wrestle myself 
out of the skin or the, the skin that others had tried to impose to see if I could develop a skin of my own that might be more authentic. So you went back then to Belfast from uh, criminal law to directing professional legal studies. What? In 1987, yes, yes I moved to Queen's. Um, there were two candidates for the job, David Trimble and myself. <laughs> and um, I didn't know he was the other candidate um, until the questions were raised in the House of Parliament um, uh, about how come this Catholic got this job. And that was me. So I back um, in an act of faith, I went back to Northern Ireland. Um, I, had, I was then a mother of three small children, and um, my husband uh, had morphed from being a, an accountant into a dentist, which was a very mean thing to do, really, <laughs> seriously. I mean, I never, I, given, a, given a choice, I wouldn't have married a dentist, <laughs> seriously. But I wasn't given a choice. I married an accountant who then morphed into a dentist. And uh, he morphed into a dentist who decided he was going to work in Northern Ireland. And um, so um, we moved back to the north. And I did what... I'm, I'm the oldest of nine children. And my mother lives... My mother and father, God rest him, they lived in a small village just north of the border. And all nine of us, when we would get married, we are going to university, we all scattered in all directions. But the minute we had children, we all converged back on my mother... Um, and we sort of surrounded her um, so that she and my father would be well positioned to be permanent babysitters, which they became. So I did that. I moved back to live with, beside my parents in Restrever. And then I was offered the job in Queen's, which was wonderful, and became, uh, for 10 years, then I worked in Queen's, uh, uh, directing the Institute of Professional Legal Studies, and then becoming um, a uh, pro, pro vice chancellor. But I arrived in Queen's just at a very important moment in the life of Queen's and in the life, really, of Northern Ireland, because Queen's is, you know, it's, it, with the intellectual life of Northern Ireland, it is very strongly tied to the intellectual life of Northern Ireland. And um, when I arrived, I arrived through the door along with two reports, one from the Equal Opportunities Commission, which said that its record on the employment of women was abysmal, which it was, and another one from the Fair Employment Commission, which said that its record on the employment of Catholics was abysmal, which it was. So now the university had to um, turn its face to both these questions. And I became part of the team that was involved in the, essentially the retraining of all of us as members of staff, you know, to be more sensitive to the prejudices and the baggage that we brought with us into interviews, into dealing with uh, colleagues, into dealing with staff, into dealing with students. Um, and we started a process of changing attitudes. You know, it, it's a, well, it's a bit like the College of Cardinals, I suppose, in a way, really, isn't it? I mean, if you have a bunch, you know, of um, white male Protestants, or white male Catholics, for that matter, or white male anything, um, who are in charge of all the jobs... Um, they're going to really like the fellows who come in wearing their old school ties, uh, which happen to be their school ties as well, and, and who reflect back to them who and what they are themselves. So it's no surprise that certain people go into interviews with an advantage that is subtly, <coughs> subtly invisible and subtly visible to those who know it's important. So um, we, had a, we had a job to do to try and redress that. And uh, in fairness to the university and the university staff, over a period, um, it was very evident that we made a lot of headway. Interestingly, it seems to me, we made much bigger and quicker headway on the issue of the employment of Catholics than we did with women. <laughs> I find that very telling. I'm still trying to work out the why of it, but it is still very telling that we made, we made really good headway. And um, today, I think the university can take pride in really what it's accomplished. But that was, it was the leitmotif, was it not, of Northern Ireland. Catholics find it, and still do, There's, there are still residual problems in job markets that are historically um, to do with the fact that Catholics were excluded um, from job markets, um, excluded from housing, excluded from politics, and all the rest of it. There's a historical legacy, which is being, even as we speak here, is being just chipped away, and the accretions of history, uh, what John Hewitt described brilliantly as, he said, we build to fill the centuries' arrears, and um, I think that the arrears are being filled in uh, really very well uh, today, very well. After 10 years there, or almost 10 years, you were invited to stand as President of Ireland. Hmm. Now, this wasn't your first 
uh, knowledge of the political scene, was it? Well, no, because I had been a member of a party. I had my, my, the first party I joined was the SDLP in Northern Ireland. And then when I moved to Dublin, um, at some time after I moved to Dublin, about six years after I moved to Dublin, I joined Fianna Fáil. And I ran as a candidate in an election for them, and the electorate obviously had the wit to realise that a woman with a two-and-a-half-year-old and two you know, baby twins um, it was probably not a very good candidate, really. And so I didn't get elected, and uh, thankfully. Um, and, but I had, yes, I'd, I had been... In, I, I'm always interested in politics and interested in, you know, in change and the use of politics um, as one of the vehicles for change. I was very much involved. I was a campaign person, really. I'm not a very good party political person. I'm more a campaign and issues person. Um, I had been involved. I was a founder member of the Campaign for Gay Rights in Ireland, a founder member of the um, um, Irish Commission for Prisoners Overseas, which... Um, had been deeply involved in the campaigns for the Guildford Four, Birmingham Six, um, and the Maguire fam family. Um, I tramped all of Ireland with Anne Maguire when she came out of prison um, and uh, was rebuffed by many as a government minister. And um, so I, I'd, I'd always an interest in the powers, the powerfulness of the word and the persuasive word for change. So yes, I was involved, had been involved with Fianna Fáil, but then left politics when I came back to Northern Ireland in 1997, uh, 1987. So I had no political involvement from 87 to 97. And then um, it was suggested to me in 97 that I might consider standing for an ele for election when Mary Robinson decided that she was not going to go for a second term. Um, it was suggested to me that I might consider it. And I did, and I ran, which was kind of <coughs> ironic because... I didn't have a vote in the election in which I ran, uh, being a citizen of Northern Ireland at that point, and indeed none of my family had a vote in the election either. Um, so I couldn't rely on my very extensive family, which is a pity because <laughs> my mother and her sisters between them have 60 children. Um, and so my family thought they had to increase, multiply and fill the earth all by themselves. And... Um, so I had, I had none of their votes either, uh, but by some miracle, anyway, I, I won the election. Um, and it's an interesting election because there were five candidates in that election, of whom four were women and one man. And so, anyway, I was the fortunate person to be elected, and um, I stood very clearly. The, the theme of the presidency was, and uh, to the day I finished, it was building bridges, um, I felt very strongly. What propelled me to say yes to the idea of becoming president was the idea that I had worked in the Republic, I had lived in, Nor had lived in Northern Ireland, I had all during my years in Northern Ireland, I'd always been involved in anti-sectarian work. I had written a report for the Protestant churches and the Catholic Church, Catholic Church at their request on what the, uh, what the churches could do um, by way of helping to end sectarianism and my first advice to them was, first admit how responsible um, you have been for some of it. Uh, that did not go down terribly well at the beginning, but I had tramped into every parish hall and parochial hall for t the two or th three years before I became president, trying to explain the processes by which sectarian thoughtways are transmitted, you know, from the womb, from the child, in the house, um, in, in the school playground, on the street, and how much we personally have to take responsibility as adults for what we allow children to hear and what they, particularly they hear from our mouths, repeated and repeated. Very often not directly at the child at all, but said to friends, said to family, said in the hearing of the innocent child who wants to be like his father and mother and who not surprisingly ends up carrying that baggage um, as an adult. So I've been deeply involved in all that and... Um, at that point, the, we were still, we were 30 odd years down the road of violence. I had, my parents had lost their home as a result of the violence. A gentleman, two gentlemen came to our door with submachine guns and emptied their contents through our windows to try and kill us. Our next door neighbour had been murdered the week before. They had tried to kill, my brother was the victim of an attempted murder. My father was the victim of an attempted murder. Um, they bombed my father's, uh, loyalists bombed my father's pub. Um, a young girl was killed in that explosion. She died in my father's arms. He was catatonic for two years. And I have to say, in fairness to Margaret Thatcher, 
God rest her, uh, who would not have been the most popular politician in my family's, in our household. Um, you know, we're Irish nationals, Irish, um, uh, strong Irish nationalists, so she wouldn't have been terribly popular. Uh, but she was more popular in our house than I suspect most other Irish households because I came home one day, my father hadn't spoken for two years almost after the bombing, and um, my mother said, your father started to talk today. And I said, really, what, what did he say? And he said, shut up, you old bitch. <laughs> and I said, he, he said that to you? And he she said, no, it's to some woman called Margaret Thatcher on the radio. <laughs> so, so, and my father, really until the day he died, kept up a one-way conversation with her, which kept him deeply involved in p politics and really very engaged. Um, so I have her to thank for that. I don't know what she said, but it really provoked him. Now, in your first year as president came the Good Friday Agreement, but this was not something that you were entirely new to, was it? You'd been engaged in discussions. I before. had um, something that came against me during the election, um, was uh, at my election, um, going back to the processes through which peace came about in Ireland. Um, I'm very conscious, Louise Richardson sitting in the front seat here, an expert on uh, terrorism, an expert on how uh, problems regarding terrorists get ended. And I remember listening to Louise explaining, you know, eventually, if you want these things to end, you have to talk to the people who are causing the problems. But we were in a time in Ireland when nobody was talking, you know, to anybody. All the people who needed to talk to each other, had reasons for not talking to each other. Governments wouldn't talk to terrorists because they were terrorists who weren't on ceasefire. Uh, people wouldn't go on ceasefire because governments wouldn't talk to them. Um, and then people wouldn't talk to other people because they were nationalists or they wouldn't talk to them because they were unionists. And so all we heard from each other were all the reasons why we couldn't talk to each other. All the breakpoints were right up front. We'd never explored, really. The, the yesness, the will for peace, and if you like, the areas for compromise that might exist. Into this mess came a very humble little priest called Father Alec Reed, who died this month, God rest him, redemptorist priest. And Alec would talk to anybody, and did. And he visited the prisons when few priests or anybody else would go near the prisons. And he intuited over many years of listening to the IRA prisoners that they were tired They'd now grown into middle age. They started the flight, you know, 30 years earlier, as, or 20, 25 years earlier, as young men. And now they were in prison for a long time. And either they'd no children or their kids were grown up. And they didn't, they had arrived at a point where the war couldn't be won and the war couldn't be lost. The British couldn't win it and the British couldn't lose it. It was a catch-22. And he detected this tiredness and he thought, you know, this is the moment now to try and persuade them that their strategy that has taken them this far isn't going to take them the rest of the journey they want to get to. They're going to have to devise what Alec called the alternative strategy. And so he thought, who could we get together who could try and be, who would be listened to by them and who would be persuaded, but who would be a person who could, be, who could persuade them? And he thought Jerry Adams was the person who could do the persuading. And he thought the person who could persuade Adams and give him, help him with the language and the vision would be John Hume. Now, it would be political suicide for John Hume at that time to be heard to talk to Sinn Féin. He was ex but he did. At the request of Alec and the Redemptorist priests, he did. He was excoriated. I don't know if any of you ever, who are students of Irish history would have, could have read the things that were written about him in the papers at that time. It, w it, must have been, it must have been a nightmare, going to bed at night, knowing what was written about you. Um, so they met, and indeed the Downing Street Declaration, which is 20 years old this, this, uh, this month, um, came about as a direct result of their work. Why? Because there was a fantastic Prime Minister in Britain at that time and a fantastic Prime Minister in Ireland. Two men with very little by the way of ego very little by the way of personal vanity and a good personal relationship. Two good problem solvers. One was John Major and the other was Albert Reynolds. And so we'd moved from the Thatcher times. We were now into an era where it the personality of these people mattered. And when someone like Alec 
um, through the good offices of the Irish government and was able to get to uh, them and suggest that maybe the IRA might go on ceasefire if this happened, and maybe that could happen if this happened. Somebody who was prepared to tic-tac in the back room between these people, and that really was Alec, uh, Alec Reid, um, and a, 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 a small army of people who joined this idea of the alternate strategy, uh, began to build the, the momentum for peace. Uh, Alec decided that he wanted a woman involved in this process and that he wanted lay people involved. And so I was the woman, and um, a man called Jim Fitzpatrick, who was the, chairman, the, the editor of a local newspaper, a Catholic newspaper that happened, a lovely, gorgeous um, uh, human being, he was the other person. And so we were there to try and then, we went out, for example, to the people, wherever the, wherever the pockets of resistance to this idea where we would go and talk to them with members of the SDLP who were given John Hume a hard time. We would try and explain that this strategy, you know, had at its vision um, the reconciliation that Daniel O'Connell had always wanted between the armed force or the paramilitary way of dealing with problems in Ireland and the dem democratic constitutional that, that, the, that the, the, the violent paramilitary strand would fade away and the voice, the intellectual muscle of the voice and the persuasive power would be the redemptive power and that it would be powerful and that it would have and could have a good outcome. Why? Because the paramilitary one wasn't having one. It was killing people to no end. It was causing mayhem. The people that you were going to be re wanted to be reconciled with, the neighbours, the Catholic and Protestant neighbours whom you were always going to be neighbours with, were getting more and more and more removed and estranged from one another by the daily diet of violence and the killing, the, the, the awfulness of it. Not to mention, of course, the daily diet of killing here, um, and particularly uh, in England, which was estranging that relationship even further. So the, the alternative strategy was um, articulated and eventually, over a quite a long period, won out. And I was part of that. I met um, in the monastery. Uh, we met in a place called Clonard Monastery in Belfast, uh, sometimes a couple of times a week. Um, and, um, and then Jim Fitzpatrick and I and Father Alec would go out and try and then persuade those who were you know, perhaps writing the terrible scurrilous articles debunking all this and saying it was useless and nobody should talk to these terrorists and we won't. And we were trying to say, but these are the people who are causing the problem. They're killing people. We, and Alec would always say that the, peop the reason he did this the person whose vision was in front of him was the next person lined up to die. He wanted that person to live, and I did too, and we all did. That was what we were about. So that was successful. That was highly successful because it ultimately led to uh, say the ceasefire, the Downing Street Declaration, and then it continued right the way through. Uh, when I left to become president of Ireland in 1997, I was still actively engaged in that work, but it was secret. Uh, and it had to be secret of its nature. Um, bits of it leached out, and every time they did, there was war. Just war. But I think in the end, it was vindicated. It was vindicated. Somebody had to, somebody, well, somebody had to join the dots. A wonderful Protestant clergyman who was involved also uh, in, this from, in aspects of this from time to time described lately at Father, when Father Alec died this month, he described him as an electrician who was able to bind up you know, the, various, uh, the various currents and the various strands and plug them in the right way, you know, join them up the right way, um, so that actually the energy started to flow in the right direction. And we started to get momentum behind the peace process. Up to that, well, up to that, I think the, the plug was wired the wrong way. We just always got combustion. So about 14 years later, there was the Queen's visit to Dublin. There was. Would, would you like to say something about what led to that and what it achieved? Well, I think a, a long number of years of effort led to that. I, f I first met Her Majesty the Queen in 1995 on the occasion of the 150th anniversary of the Queen's Colleges. That is to say the Queen's University of Belfast, Queen's College Galway, now University College Galway, and Queen's College Cork, now University College Cork. All three of those were founded by um, Queen Victoria, 
that's the Queen in question, the Queen's College. So on the 150th anniversary, um, on the 150th anniversary, we were invited to a joint celebration in St James's Palace, and um, I um, was the person uh, deputed on behalf of my university to introduce the Queen to the various groupings. And the day beforehand, I was rather worried about the protocol because um, I was afraid that it would be expected of me that I would um, genuflect, bow um, um, to Her Majesty the Queen, um, uh, curtsy. And um, I don't do that. I mean, I don't kiss bishops' rings, I don't curtsy to popes, um, and I don't curtsy to monarchs. And, I, you know, it's just part and parcel of the makeup. Um, uh, the, the strong egalitarian sense that runs through me um, and, but I on the other hand had great admiration for her and um, I would not have wished in any shape or form to embarrass her or indeed my university so I took the precaution of going make an appointment to see the master of her household to explain my position and to say look if this causes embarrassment I think we should get someone else to do it and he said to me ah Curtsy, don't curtsy. It's gone out of fashion. Do it if you like. They all do anyway. Yeah, you know, she's a professional. Won't bother her. Do whatever you like. I said, God, that's great. That's brilliant. He was so relaxed about it. And I said, as a matter of interest, are you interested in hearing why? I said, if you've got two minutes, I'll explain to you where I'm coming from as a, an Irish Catholic who always feels when she speaks and talks to her loyal subjects, I instantly feel, oh, God, I'm not one of them. I'm one of those disloyal people. And, and the reconciliation of that is very difficult. And so a week later, I got a phone call saying she'd like to have lunch with you and have a conversation about this, which we did have. And um, it was a wonderful conversation during which I was amazed to discover the great interest she had in Ireland and the great depth of knowledge she had. And at that meeting, she disclosed to me what a heartbreak it was to her that because of the political circumstances, she could not visit Dublin, or Ireland, actually, she said. Uh, she could obviously visit Northern Ireland, had done many times, but couldn't come to the Republic. Um, and it was a particular, uh, particular sadness to her because she, I think, had 25 horses, um, <laughs> which, which had been um, trained in Ireland, and she'd never managed to see them run on any race course there. Um, so, um, so we discussed this at some length, and um, then when I became elected uh, two years later, uh, the first letter that I received from her reminded me um, of what I'd said to her at that time, and I said, well, you know, I think that we should work, all of us should be working towards a time when our, these two neighbouring islands are so neighbourly that that visit would be just taken for granted. And never thinking that I would be in a position myself to do anything particularly big about that. But of course, as soon as I became president, um, I decided then that, that was, it was going to be something that we would work towards. Uh, not for its own sake, incidentally, not for its own sake, but because of the inbuilding, the infilling of those centuries' arrears, which I knew would have to be filled in before such a visit could take place. And I wanted to be around in Ireland where we had done that work. I committed to doing that work as president, the work of building bridges, um, opened up our house to people who over their dead bodies would come to it, but eventually came without the dead bodies, thankfully. Um, had the cup of tea, talked, you know, talked about kids, talked about politics, um, talked our way through to a new understanding of one another, reduced the levels of fears, uh, people came to our house who, uh, from the loyalist and the unionist community who had never stood in the Republic, who never thought they would stand in the Republic, to make them feel comfortable. And the, the, uh, my, my, the ethic behind it from the beginning was they're welcome as neighbours. We are not about the business of evangelising for converts. Because I think that we had both come out of a very strong evangelical tradition where we tried to convert each other to our own worldview, and what made us unhappy about each other was our unwillingness to be converted. We thought each other incredibly irredentist because unionists wouldn't become nationalists and nationalists wouldn't become unionists. We couldn't conceive of a world where nationalists and unionists could live together and work as good neighbours and park their political ambitions, as we have done now in the Good Friday Agreement, contain them there in a place that is safe, has process attached to it, Northern Ireland is constitutionally part of the United Kingdom until such times as people change their minds. And they'll be asked every so often, do you want to change your minds? Do you want to be part of United Ireland? And there it is, you know, it, this process, uh, well-constructed 
and safely managed. So um, I became part of that, that um, if you like, taking up the, the parody of esteem, um, the good neighbourliness that was the ethic of the Good Friday Agreement. We aim to make the House of the President in Ireland a place where, that would underpin the process, knowing as I do, incidentally, that I will not live to see the end of the process. I know we're all going to live a very long time now. I'm told that every young girl who's born in Ireland now has a 50% chance of living to 100. All I can say is I hope they grow a third set of teeth. Um, <laughs> um, and say no more about that. Um, but um, So I know I won't live to see the end of this process because it has been generations in the incubation. I mean centuries in the incubation. And the toxic spores of history have a very, very, very long shelf life. I mean, it seems to me extraordinary that we are still talking Reformation politics, you know. But we are. That's what we're still doing. And um, so, you know, we have all of that um, to, st to try and contend with now. And we have, we have obviously got wonderful things that we didn't have in past generations. We have the joy of, um, of education. We have the joy of the European Union, the fact that we are neighbours in, in, in Europe, the fact that between Ireland and Britain in particular, we now have the joy of sequentially excellent relationships. John Major, Albert Reynolds, Tony Blair, Bertie Ahern, David Cameron now, and, and uh, Enda Kenny. Extraordinarily warm, friendly, egalitarian, you know, neighbourliness. Um, we don't expect the other to be anything other than the other. But we accept the other, and in particular, we now have a friendship with the other. We do not expect to be permanently estranged from the other precisely because of their otherness. So um, we've now learnt, learnt to, you know, that you can live with otherness and they can live with ours. And that's what we did in the House, in the House of the Presidents called Aris and Octeron. Uh, we opened it up. Um, I held the very first ever official reception for the Orange Order and for the 12th of July um, in the House of the Irish President, I mean, go figure, um, <laughs> and was excoriated in the Irish press at the very beginning because they hadn't a clue. This is what I mean about the Dublin press really hadn't a clue what I was about. I mean, they talked about having bonfires and having no idea that this was about making people welcome in their own, on their own island, on their own terms, you know, taking their culture, a culture that had been regarded as separate from mine, and saying, you're welcome here, and showing that actually we could commemorate together. And we held those, uh, we held those commemorations um, for 14 years and deliberately didn't make them a commemoration just for one side, but made them a commemoration for the children of both Jacobite and Williamite. Because that's what we were and that's what we are. The children, regrettably still, talking about Jacobites and Williamites, long gone. I mean, William's long gone on his horse and James too, but we are still living. This is what I mean about the toxic spores with their long shelf life still stretching out into the past. And I feel very strongly that we had to create a generation that would stand against the, the transmission of those toxic spores. Some generation was going to have to build a hermetically sealed wall that did not allow those spores to constantly jump over into the next generation and ruin the future before it was even lived. So it seemed to me that's what we had to do. And to do that, you had to do things like celebrate the 12th of July in Aris and Octeron, have them walking around, you know, with the big drums. And they are definitely an outdoor instrument, incidentally. I learned that from first principles. Uh, and enjoy it, and celebrate it, and love it, and, and do things with it. And um, it's a great source of, of um, joy to me to see up in Derry, for example, that the 12th of July is now a place that used to be shut down, and everybody went to Donegal, who could get out of the place. Every business shut down. Now the 12th of July is a shared communal f festival. Now, it hasn't quite permeated to Belfast yet, but... Um, please God, you know, the good w example, the good witness will eventually teach people that it's better to share the commemoration or at least create the space for it to be um, an object or a, an experience that is uplifting to the community generally rather than one that is scary. So that's what we did for 14 years. And meanwhile, the politicians, they did their work on the Good Friday Agreement, which was very difficult, the implementation of it. Um, then came the St Andrews Agreement, 
um, which was you know, a wonderful part of the experience because if you remember, the people who were left out of the Good Friday Agreement were the DUP, the Paisley Party, would have nothing to do with the Good Friday Agreement. But they began to see they began to see the benefits of the Good Friday Agreement. They began to see, first of all, although they were sometimes regarded as the margins, the extremes, actually, they were mainstream. They got the, a huge number of votes. A lot of people voted for them. They were very much a mainstream party. But they saw the opportunities now being presented by the Good Friday Agreement as the um, as the structures started to give rise to a government, God help us, where Catholics and Protestants worked together. And they began to see that they could be part of that. And so um, they negotiated and helped to negotiate um, a further, uh, the further, further reach of the Good Friday Agreement, and we got the St Andrew's Agreement. That worked its way out, plenty of ups and downs, um, including, unfortunately, some, um, regrettably, the, this real IRA, this last fragment, this last throw of the dice, this last sting in the tail that we have, this little fragment of a terrorist organisation, um, killing, if you remember, two, two soldiers at Masserine. And if ever anything proved to me the value of just talking to people and befriending people, it was that, because... On that night, we firmly, a lot of people firmly expected when those two young um, soldiers were murdered um, by this fragment um, that called itself the real IRA, that the peace process would crumble and that there would be tit-for-tat retaliation from the loyalists. My husband got on the phone and he spent 24 hours on the phone talking to every loyalist paramilitary he knew. And the next day, the Secretary of State rang him and said, thank you. That calmed things down. And then the chief constable uh, rang him and said, you know, that made all the difference. He said, because there are people who can talk to people and there are people who, because of their positions, can't. And my husband, like Father Alec, would talk to anybody. Um, and that helped calm things. There was no tit for tat. And it gave us an opportunity then to see the robustness of the public solidarity around the Good Friday Agreement and to realize we weren't talking any longer as two communities something had synthesized around the Good Friday Agreement and the St Andrews Agreement, and now we were talking as one community, a Good Friday, a Good Friday stroke St Andrews community. So into the game came the DUP, and really from that moment on, I think, we have seen the strong robustness of the Good Friday Agreement. And then we had the de devolution of policing. That was one of the last parts of the jigsaw puzzle. And we had to wait for all these things to happen before Her Majesty the Queen could come to Ireland. And every time I met her, we talked about it. And every time I met her, it came into the public purview, but we knew we just had to wait for the right moment. And then we got the right moment, and God, in his infinite wisdom, decided that was the moment the government would collapse. <laughs> I couldn't actually believe it. I had just managed to get um, the rate that we'd just got the devolution of policing. Bertie O'Hearn had announced that when that happened, the Queen would come. We got that, and then bingo, the government collapsed. And I said to the then outgoing Taoiseach, the Prime Minister, I said, look, you know, uh, I've been President for 14 years now, and I'm leaving office in a few months' time. I've never asked you for anything in all those years. I'm going to ask you for something now. Would you announce the Queen's visit? And straight back, he said, yeah, I'll do that, he said. He said, but on one condition, he said, I have to check with the incoming government if they'd be happy with it. And he said, if they say yes, he said, I will announce it. So he did, and they both said, the two, the two, remember the two, the two parties in the new government both said yes. And I suppose it was easy for them. If it was a disaster, the new government could say, well, they organised it. <laughs> um, and um, so, you know, and if it was a success, well, then everybody could, could take part in it. And anyway, the Queen came. We had four extraordinary days. Um, during And the best, I was telling David earlier a story that summarised it for me. The Queen was utterly amazing in the four days. She was just From the moment she stepped off the plane in the first of quite a number of wonderfully green outfits. Um, um, one more gorgeous than the next. And, of course, when she did that, I mean, every woman in the country went, oh, yeah, like that. Gorgeous. So she had the women won over completely on day one. And then the first place she visited, the very first place she visited was our National Garden of Commemoration. Now, what's it commemorating? 
It's commemorating all those people who tried, by use of violence, to get rid of British rule out of Ireland. You know, all our heroes, all who, by the, by, from the Unionist point of view, are regarded as terrorists, bad people, not nice people, people you wouldn't celebrate. This is our garden, um, right in the centre of Dublin, and uh, the Garden of Remembrance, and that's the first place she went. And she and I walked up the steps and laid a wreath, and then she did something. Now, the very fact that she was there itself, and that was her first place, that talks to a place in your being that I wasn't there for when these men died, but I still carry, as every Irish nationalist does, their story until it is vindicated. And so she's there, and you know that all over Ireland, people's breaths are stopping in this moment because now history has taken a lurch in a different direction, different trajectory. And then she did something that nobody expected. When she stood back, she nodded. Simple thing. Not a word. Not a word, but a gesture of respect. Won over people almost instantly. And then she went to a place called Croke Park, which many of you will know of. It's the headquarters of the true religion of Ireland, which is Gaelic sport. Um, and um, in that stadium, Croke Park, in 1920, we had the first bloody Sunday in November of 1920. British troops um, came in in tanks and opened fire on a match that was in play. They killed a player and they killed spectators, murdered them on that day. One of those players, um, one of the most famous stands is now called after him, Michael Hogan, and she walked through the Hogan stand onto the pitch. Now, going there itself was amazing. That they let her go there was even more amazing because you can imagine the negotiations that would have to be done with the GAA in order that she would be let go there. This is hallowed turf. But interestingly, they, they, they bought into it almost immediately, you know. And again, my husband went and talked to them and they bought into it immediately. And um, she went there and got a great welcome and her husband was seen to hold an Irish hurl. And um, these, again, not a, not a word, all gesture, but healing, healing. And then she did the most remarkable thing of all, I think, in many ways, which was at the state dinner, um, the first five words she spoke were in Irish. Now, again, there was no word of, you know, sorry for, you know, all those centuries of domination, blah, blah, blah. We weren't expecting that. We weren't expecting that because somehow those words can get analysed. Gesture and, I think, iconic ways of dealing with things stay much, much longer in the heart and the soul and do much more powerful work. Those five words in the Irish language just were extraordinary. If you knew the history of what the British tried to do to the Irish language, how they tried to end it, to disrupt it, to kill it off, as, as part of the way of subduing <coughs> Ireland, everybody watching knew that, you know. And she uses those five words, and in those five words, all the anger and frustration and sense of injustice melt away. Why? Because she's showing such respect to the language and also she used it brilliantly because she spoke with a northern, she spoke with an Ulster blast. <laughs> so much so that I instantly knew who had, who had coached her. <laughs> I was amazed. I mean really, really, really amazed. It was phenomenal. Just a phenomenal moment. Anyway, at the end of the, at the, end of the four days, on the, th on the third day she went to Cashel. Sinn Féin would have nothing to do with the visit. I had tried every which way to persuade them to be part of the visit, but I couldn't. So we said, fine. My view is, well, 90% of something's better than 100% of nothing. Don't worry about it. If this thing goes well, it will hopefully create a step out into the void, and that'll be a step that somebody else can stand on, and maybe someday in the future they'll shake her hand. Fine. So they didn't turn up at any of the events. But the thing was going so well. We had two days of wonderful visits, when on the third day she went to Cashel. Now, the mayor of Cashel was a member of Sinn Féin, and he had observed what had happened for the two days beforehand and how welcomed she was, but also, not just how professional she was, but how she hadn't come to lord it over the Irish. She had come as a good neighbour, with a heart that was broken for all the misery and all the hurt and all the unnecessary vanities of history. And she was there to do her best to heal them if she could. And people recognised that, and they saw it. I mean, it was lived out every moment in everything she did. So, 
On the third day, the mayor of Cashel said, Sugar, I'm going to meet her, which he did. Now, he, as it happened, he was dying of cancer, and he didn't give a toss what the party said. But I still think in my heart and soul that he probably knew by then that the constituency that was afraid to meet her, because, well, the, the politicians who were afraid to meet her in the part of Sinn Féin, who you know, probably were worried about their constituency, were now watching their constituency, and they weren't jumping up and down with indignation. They were like everybody else. They were glued to the television um, and bowled over by the visit. So he, vis he met her. So that was the Sinn Féin you know, element of it brought into the equation. And subsequently, of course, Martin McGuinness did, in fact, meet her in Northern Ireland and shook her hand. And then, anyway, on the fourth day, she went to Cork and got a great welcome there, memorable welcome. And um, I got a letter shortly after from an old lady which said, I'm a 90-year-old Irish Republican, and I don't like monarchs. And in particular, I've no time for the monarch from that place next door. And I thought that you shouldn't have asked her. And, but out of deference to you, I thought I'd watch the first five minutes on television. <laughs> and then I watched for four days. <laughs> and I cried sore. And when she left us, she said, I reflected back on those four days. And I reckoned they were choreographed by the angels. And I thought that was beautiful. And you couldn't ask for anything more. Because I'd said to my husband on the day we were leaving, the day we went into the House of the President, we're going to do our very best here now for the next 14 years to show people that we can actually learn to love one another anew. And I said, we'll know at the end of it if this so-called great commandment to love one another actually works, because Christians are beating the crap out of each other in Northern Ireland, and they haven't really tried this one. So why don't we just try it and see if perhaps it might work? And at the end of 14 years, when we left, as we walked through the door, I said to Martin, I think that worked. I think that worked. And on that, over those four days, you could actually feel the, just the, you know, the neighbourliness that we've always had, for, the yesness for each other, that politics and history, and the, the way in which we taught history and used history, the way in which it divided us, you could feel that melting away. And you could feel this new this new relationship that is evolving and that will probably, I'm sure, be part of the Scottish story also because at the end of the day, we're all neighbours. We aren't going anywhere. You know, Catholics aren't going anywhere. Protestants aren't going anywhere. The English aren't going anywhere. The Scottish aren't. We're always going to be neighbours. And the best way to be neighbours would be to be good neighbours rather than to be bad neighbours to one another because uh, that's so wasteful of human life and so wasteful of human endeavour. And we've got so much experience of the waste and here we are, we're intelligent, we're educated, we're living in a European Union where we share, I mean, it's the first union that the Irish ever voluntarily joined, um, and we sit down as equals with our English neighbours and our Scottish neighbours and our Welsh neighbours, and we get on like a house on fire. And so we find that, we're beginning to find that again in each other as we park and manage the vanities of history that conduce to violence, and we try to reconcile them you know, piano piano, as the Italians say, little by little, not by, not by pushing and shoving and persuading by guns or violence, but rather by the integrity of argument. So when she came, we were ready. And since she has come, I think, um, I think that it has changed the trajectory of Irish-British history. Well, you're now in a place, or you're now studying in a place which claims to be closer to the angels than either Dublin or <laughs> Belfast. Yes, well... And would you like to say something briefly about why you went there and what you're doing? Yes, well, um, I decided... Um, uh, part, part, of, part of the reinterrogating the, the who I am and what I am was look at, looking again at my church. I was um, a, a cradle Catholic. I'm one of those people who, you know, was taken at three weeks, brought down to the chapel, um, baptised, and not just baptised into the Christa Fidelis, but apparently baptised for life into the Latin Rite Roman Catholic Church, um, and um, grew up as a Catholic. Would have been so much easier had I not been a Catholic in Northern Ireland. I mean, every day of the week would have been so much easier had I been a Buddhist, an atheist, a Protestant of any description. Uh, but anyway, I stuck with it and um, managed to stay with it through thick and an awful lot of thin. And um, decided, uh, as I was planning my retirement, what I might do with my retirement. And I thought, well, you know, I might just apply it 
to getting to understand this church of mine, which ha wasn't doing so well. Uh, we'd just been through all the clerical child sex abuse scandals. And as my children remarked to me, Mum, you grew up in a different time. They said, my 31-year-old daughter said to me, you know, since we were young teenagers, the church has been subject to criminal and civil investigations, just like the mafia. And that stopped me in my tracks. And I said, well, that's a very different perspective. My children are growing up with a very, very different take on church from, the, if you like, the obese and deferential respect um, and the emphasis on obedience that I grew up with. And so I decided, I'm a lawyer, I'm interested in law, I'm interested in structure. I wondered how it all got so messed up. Um, and I thought I would start to look at structure. So before I ended my time in, in, as president, I did a master's degree in uh, canon law. And uh, because we had this thing, if you don't know if you remember, the thing called the Murphy Report. Uh, the Murphy Report was an investigation into the Dublin Archdiocese handling of clerical child sex abuse. It wasn't an investigation into the allegations of abuse, but how the abusing priests had been dealt with by their Episcopal superiors. It makes really pretty poor reading now. And um, a, line in it, a line in it just really bothered me. And that line, there's a whole c chapter on canon law, and the line, said, one of the line in this chapter said that in not a single incident, not a single incident that had been investigated by the commission, did canon law operate to assist a victim. Not one. And that brought me back to my days as um, a young law student and a lawyer in Northern Ireland. And a line in a report that was done on Northern Ireland where it said subsequently, uh, to the beginning of the trouble, is that had the courts been and had the legal system responded to the legitimate, um, legitimate um, civil rights demands of Catholics for one man, one vote, for uh, access to housing and access to jobs, had the courts been usable um, as a forum for the vindication of their rights, then the story would have been very different. There wouldn't have been any, any need oh, inverted commas, to resort to more active and violent oriented ways of expressing oneself. In other words, it was a facility that simply did not work, didn't do the best job it could. And here was I reading this now about canon law, you know, 40 years later, and I thought, well, I think I'd like to know why. So I decided I would, um, and I did my master's degree in canon law when I looked at the structure of the church, and I wrote a book then subsequently on, on, so, on collegiality in the church, which was a very short book, obviously. And, um, <laughs> um, uh, and I'm very, I have to say now, very gratified. I wrote that during Benedict's time, and now we're in Francis's time, and he's saying things that were apparently, when I wrote the book during Benedict's time, when they were regarded as absolutely <laughs> unacceptable, but apparently Francis now thinks they're all right, uh, because he's saying the same kind of things. And in, in his recent apostolic exhortation, he said that, you know, the church needed to be more collegial, needed to drive out the, um, you know, subsidiarize um, a lot of the power structure, take it away from Rome, decentralize, you know, and he's inviting people to give him, um, inviting people to give him ideas on how the papal powers could be better used and how he could be stripped of power and given it to and give that power, diffuse it to other people. So I'm just going to send him a copy of my books. I've already got it all written now. <laughs> and um, so um, I did that, and then I decided I wanted to do um, uh, um, look at the whole issue of children's rights and canon law, and because um, nobody else was writing on it, and. Um, so I started to do, and the only place, there's, there only are two places in the world where you can do it in English. One is Washington and one is Ottawa. And um, neither of them appealed to me because they were too far away. And so I decided, ah, sure, I'll go to Rome and be really, just annoy them really greatly. And um, I get maximum sort of provocation value by being in Rome, I suppose. And, um, and also maximum, um, you know, access to that whole uh, Roman Thing that I might get, I might actually begin to unpack that and understand it and um, better. And um, so I, I decided to go to Rome and do my studies there through Italian. And um, 
which was fine and fantastic and fascinating when I eventually got my head around Italian. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm one of very few women and very few lay people who are studying at the Pontifical Gregorian University, which is essentially, you know, it's really main, has been mainly for clerics um, uh, and people who are um, either on their way to being clerics or who actually are. But they've got over the fact that um, in the very first few weeks that I was there, they would ask you a question. You're standing in a queue for a cup of coffee and somebody would turn around and say, what religious order do you belong to? And you'd say, I'm standing here in my jeans, like in, you know, in jeans and, and hiking boots, which is my, you know, my, my uniform in Rome. And say, no, I'm, I'm not actually a nun. Um, <laughs> oh, are you? And then the next question almost invariably you know, was, well, you know, are you a consecrated virgin? <laughs> you know, and you'd say, no, 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 actually I'm married 36 years, got three children. Uh, no, so try again. Um, and, and I'd say to them, when I meet new people, I would generally now say to them, actually, it's just better not to presume things. Just ask me who I am rather than, you know, which box do you tick before you get to the point where there are no boxes left and they're looking at you as if you're some kind of alien. Um, so it took a while for them to accept that, they're, you know, that, that a, a retired grandmother... Um, ex-president person um, might actually be their classmate. And I think that you're in a position publicly to uh, deny the, the rumour that you're going to be the first female cardinal. I don't it. No, really. No, no, no. Absolutely. Not, not going to happen. No, some, anybody who's been reading the papers will know that they, they've had a field day now um, uh, speculating that Francis is going to appoint a female cardinal. I can tell you absolutely. Well, first of all, it's not going to happen, but it certainly won't be me uh, for this reason. Um, well, Francis himself, in fact, has, has indicated that it's not going to happen, and for very good reason. Um, my answer to that, very simply, and I said it at a conference on Friday last in Rome, if you're thirsting in the desert for 2,000 years, as women have been in the Catholic Church, or in the Church, because it wasn't always the Catholic Church, but as they have been in the Church for the last 2,000 years, then what you really need is a long, long drink of cold, cold water. You know, a glass of red champagne is, believe me, not an answer. So um, the very idea of appointing women to the College of Cardinals may very well be a nice idea in 50 years' time, you know, when all other things being equal, all other things are equal. Um, but we're absolutely not near there. And, and I think the Pope indicated at the weekend in an interview that it wasn't going to happen because it would be tokenism and clericalism, the clericalizing of women um, in the worst way possible. Um, but on the other hand, he does say in his apostolic exhortation of last month that um, the church now is challenged to find ways of involving women in decision-making in the church and that it's an issue they can no longer run away from. I mean, it's been run away from really since Vatican II. Paul VI posed the question at Vatican II, where are the other 50%? Well, the answer was very simple. You didn't ask them. I mean, they weren't there because they, they didn't. It wasn't that they didn't turn up. It was that they weren't invited. And, and that question hung over the council, and it's been hanging over the church ever since, and they have made really no shape at, at answering it um, until now. Uh, Pope Francis has put the question out there, and be interesting to see what he does with it, because a lot of things are stacked up, it seems to me, around it. He's also indicated, of course, that the, the question of ordination of women to the priesthood is not on the agenda, not on his agenda. Fine. Um, except, of course, that that is strongly related to the issue of ecumenical relations. It is the thing that killed ecumenical relations, which were going reasonably well until the Anglican Communion, rightly in my view, um, decided to ordain women. And at that point, then, uh, that became a major problem with the Catholic Church. So there are a lot of things stacked up around that. Um, the glacial pace of ecumenical relations now um, are really, I think, directly attributable to the issue of women, um, uh, women and priesthood um, in the Catholic Church and in the Anglican Communion. So, um, but th this priest, or this Pope does seem to have opened up a new landscape for debate, including the Synod and the Family, which they're now uh, going to have next year. Um, I don't know if any of you are aware of this, but the Pope has called an extraordinary Synod next year to, uh, to look at and advise him on the problems facing the modern family, um, the challenges, and particularly the challenges to evangelization. 
And, um, and, ob and the obvious thing to do, obviously, uh, was to call together 250 celibate men who don't have family life. <laughs> um, yeah. and, um, and to overcome that slight credibility gap, um, <laughs> Uh, they, have, um, they have sent out a questionnaire um, to all the dioceses um, which ask questions of people who might actually know answers um, to the issues of family life. Uh, but he has at least engendered a debate um, about things like, for example, Humanae Vitae, um, which there has been really no debate on for the last 40 years. Um, so, uh, in fairness, this is a man who, in his suitcase, when he arrived from Argentina, brought with him, and unobserved, a very large spoon um, which he is now stirring things up with mightily. <laughs> well, I'm sure that uh, there are those of us who feel you might have looked very fetching in a Kappa Magna, but... Um... <laughs> <laughs> the thought did occur to me that if they ever did get around to, you know, to, um, not obviously in this century, but when they ever do get around to, um, to having women cardinals, um, that you know all those Kappa Magnas, and particularly Cardinal Burke's very fetching one. Have you seen Cardinal Burke's Kappa Magna? Um, it's about 50 metres of amazing red silk that requires a person 50 metres behind you uh, to be lifting it up. I think, actually, he got the message, that, and it's been put away now, really, because it's a bit embarrassing. Um, I mean, it was designed for the days when cardinals went round the place on horseback, um, uh, but anyway, he, pr he processed up a few aisles wearing it, and then, uh, and, and actually Paul VI, I think, if I remember rightly, had more or less said, put them away, lads, they're a bit embarrassing now. Um, you can't be going into Gemarelli's and, and or ordering, you know, a 15 metres of red silk to be turned into a cape. Um, uh, so, but anyway, it did occur to me that if they got them together, I mean, the, that they could make, a, there are a few women handy with needles there, could turn them into nice little exactly. outfits. Uh, because you know perfectly well what was going to happen is the very first woman cardinal ever appointed, I mean, that's all they're going to talk about is what she's wearing. <laughs> that's true. Just know it. God help her, whoever she is. Well, Mary, anyway, it won't be me. <coughs> Mary, thanks a million for that wonderful hour and a half, really, and I, I'm afraid the hour and a half has excluded any possibility of questions. Aww. But, <laughs> Unless uh, anybody has a short, one short question. There's yes. One Madam President, can you tell me, in your view, given that the trouble started in the 1960s when the Belfast and the Clyde engineering vanished mm -hmm. off the face of the earth, did that not have some a cause in the re-emergence of the sectarian violence? And do we run the danger at present with our young people having no economic future visible that all the work becomes under? You know what? That's a bloody good question. <laughs> that is such a good question. And I think it's an issue not just for Scotland and Ireland, but right across Europe. Um, I'm living in Italy where 40% of young people are unemployed. What are we offering them? What are we offering? You're absolutely right. Because the collapse of the shipyard industries, these were generations who had always, always had access to jobs. Granddad went in, he brought the brother in, he brought the nephew in, and then, of course, we called that nepotism because we were, you know, these were, you know, but in fairness, it was a system. And it was a system that worked for a community. And it gave them hope, and it gave them money in their pockets, and it gave them dignity. And all of a sudden, it just collapsed. And yes, of course, they were ready fodder because they were angry. And because their loyalty to the government, they, 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 they were loyal. They were always the people who were loyal. And because they were loyal, they expected to be rewarded with jobs. And now they weren't. And yes, they became fodder for paramilitarism, just in the same way that the young Catholics who couldn't get jobs anyway were also fodder for paramilitarism. And that, you're quite right, and we should really keep our eye on that ball because um, 
I remember saying it years ago about the city of Limerick um, when I was a journalist working um, for RTE and the city had um, nothing to offer young people. Be very careful of these young people because the city of Belfast, where I come from, you know, my mother always used to say, the devil finds work for idle hands. Um, and the truth of the matter is that we then developed this um, really serious uh, crime culture in that city, which thankfully now a lot of huge work has gone into, um, but had to go into subsequently, into trying to eradicate. Where did that come from? It came from being made to feel like nothing. Being made to feel like nothing by all the powers around, by feeling powerless. And when you feel, particularly young macho males, feeling powerless, and somebody says, well, you could be a lieutenant, you could be a general, I can give you a gun, a gun is very powerful, where do we think the drugs culture comes from? Where do we think the violent culture that surrounds the drugs culture comes from? It comes from that thirst for power and influence and dignity and respect, but it's just channeled in a really very, very dysfunctional direction. And I think, that, I think you've asked a question that should exercise the minds of all of us right around Europe at this moment, uh, when so many of our young people do not have hope in their lives. But even, I've, just, I've worked for the last three months in America, teaching in Boston College, and almost every day, the, the American press has been full of questions about the value of education. Education is so expensive there. So very, very expensive. Young people coming out of colleges with a quarter of a million of debt and 500,000 of debt and no jobs. And now they're asking the question, well, is education valuable? Um, is it of any worth? And you're trying to say, well, of course it is. Absolutely it is. But against a backdrop where economically they're saying it's not, it's not reaping the rewards. And you've got that frustration building. So I think it's a good question that needs to be very much in our minds. Uh, we owe our, we're lucky in Ireland, we've always got the, lucky is not the right word, but unfortunately it's true. Historically, when, when we, we grow a lot of young people to send out in the immigrant boats, you know, and now we have our young people are once again emigrating as they've done for generations and only that little short window of the Celtic tiger when they stayed home, which was so wonderful. When we had them at home, we felt the surging power of what could happen when we had full employment. And I think actually that's what he, has held us See and kept us sane for the last few years, the memory of that, that it is doable, um, but doable obviously on terms that don't involve spending money on things you don't need with money you don't have. Um, so please goodness there will come a time when we will, you know, when we get back to, to that sense of surging self-confidence that comes from keeping your young people at home if that's what they want. But we've always had that, we've always had that, um, that uh, safety valve. But not everybody has that safety valve, and where you know the devil does make work for idle hands. Well, one more. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, Madam President, and uh, thank you for your remarks. Um, I would like to express my reservoir of gratitude for your efforts in establishing peace in Northern Ireland. Um, I'm only a 19-year-old student, but I've been lucky enough to know 14 or 15 years of peace in my life. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, given the summer we have had um, with considerable unrest in Belfast, could you perhaps, perhaps elicit uh, the reasons for unionist dissent and why the unionist communities appear to be reticent in joining in the peace process? And on a rather cheeky note, given the, action, um, given the uh, <coughs> actions of several world leaders, would you be up for a selfie or photograph? Or <laughs> perhaps... <laughs> or perhaps uh, a, 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 your autograph for... A uh, big fan of yours from Warpoint, which is quite close to that, uh, <laughs> that village of yours from back home. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, can yeah. I invite Professor Principal Louise Richardson to propose a vote of thanks? Oh, sorry I can't answer your question, but apologies. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think that was a wonderful vote of thanks in and of itself, but I'm absolutely delighted to um, have this opportunity to offer on our behalf a vote of thanks for your comments this afternoon. But I also want to uh, presume to offer a vote of thanks uh, on behalf of, of um, people who haven't asked me to, uh, to issue them. And the first is a vote of thanks from, from women everywhere for the role uh, you have had and the actions you've taken. It's, it's becoming increasingly common, I think, for organizations and governments 
countries even to appoint a woman uh, leader. Uh, but almost all of them, when they do so, um, do so once, uh, convince themselves of their own virtue and liberalism, and then feel, that, well, that issue's been parked now for at least a generation. Uh, it is very, very rare for a woman to succeed a woman in the leadership of any organization. Um, and while a lot of attention is given to the first woman, and it, the first woman in any role is indeed difficult, um, the, the role of the second woman is uh, inordinately diffi difficult too. Uh, and in the case of the Irish presidency, um, we had, uh, Ireland, I've always said, has been extremely lucky in its presidents. Uh, we had an, in Mary Robinson, uh, I believe, the, the first, uh, the best president up to that time uh, in Ireland. And then we had a second woman emerge as president, blessed with the same first name, um, and who demonstrated by being an extraordinary and utterly different president, just the breadth of, of women's ability, of women's talent. Her presidency was um, entirely different from Mary Robinson's and um, every bit as good in an entirely different way. And I think that did untold benefits uh, for women everywhere, including young children, looking and saying, no, there is no one model for the successful, brilliant women leader. The, the, the range of uh, successful uh, women leaders is as broad as it is for men. And you demonstrated that to us, and you um, uh, were a model for women everywhere, I think. And we're all very grateful to you for that. And the other... Um, Thanks, I would like to issue is really, again, I'm just presuming to speak on their behalf, but I'm, I'm confident doing so, uh, is not just the people of Ireland, but the people of, of both Britain and Ireland for the impact of your presidency on relations between um, our two countries. You spoke with characteristic modesty and characteristic wit about the Queen's uh, visit, and you described it as being choreographed by the angels, but I suspect it was choreographed by you. Um, <laughs> I had, <laughs> I had the great good fortune to, to be in, in Dublin um, because you generously invited me. Um, and um, I think it's easy to look back on, on this event, the seminal event in the relations between uh, these two countries, and uh, think of it, well, of course, it was always going to go well. But I remember getting a taxi and, uh, to, to travel to Oris on Uchtaron uh, the morning the Queen arrived. And... Um, the city of Dublin was deserted in a way I'd never seen it deserted. And there was a palpable tension in the air. Nobody knew how this was going to go. It was an act of extraordinary courage uh, to invite the Queen, and not just to invite Her Majesty, but to be involved in the selection of, of as you said, the, the visit to the Garden of Remembrance, and Croke Park, all the seminal, um, harsh, raw, um, incidents uh, in Irish history. And I remember standing outside Orson Uchtron and listening to the, um, the three military bands uh, play God Save the Queen. And it is a, a, a moment I will remember my entire life. I am as cynical as they come. And, <laughs> uh, and my cynicism vanished. That was a deeply emotional moment. And to every one of us there, we knew we were experiencing his, in history. We knew that Anglo-Irish uh, relations would never be the same again. I felt I was witnessing Ireland growing up, and uh, we're all enormously in your debt for that. Um, and then uh, what I was invited to do is to thank you for your comments here today, and I think we've just seen a, a tour de force. Um, you've just been exposed to what the Irish people had the great benefit from for, for 14 years. Um, this combination of wit, frankness, uh, a laser-sharp mind, uh, but an openness and a generosity of spirit. Um, it was very interesting to learn that Daniel O'Connell was a, a, your hero. Um, I think um, that, that's very revealing. I think, it, um, of course, because of his legal mind and his, his, um, his concern for the dispossessed. But Daniel O'Connell was also a superb orator and we've seen your oratorical skills today. And he was also an extraordinary political organizer. In fact, I've often thought that he had a, a, an impact on American politics that hasn't been analyzed or realized at all. In the 1920s, he mobilized all of rural Ireland on a parish basis uh, for, um, in favor of Catholic emancipation. This was a couple of decades before mass 
uh, emigration from Ireland, although emigration was still heavy at the time. And Irish people, uh, having been trained in political organizing by O'Connell, went to America, went to American cities, built the party politics that they had learned in rural Ireland and transformed this um, politics of cities like New York and Chicago uh, and Boston. Uh, so I suspect um, uh, you share not just his interest in the dispossessed, not just his legal mind, but, but also his oratorical skills and his, um, and his skill of political organizing, because it takes real organization, although um, characteristically so much of yours has been behind the scenes, putting other people uh, uh, front in the front, but ensuring success uh, from behind the scenes. And finally, just a, a comment on, on um, the point you made about the use of history and um, this delightful line you said, how we ransacked history for ammunition to support our worldview. Um, and that is so true in Irish history, but it's not unique to Irish history. I think you will find in the extremists all over the world that they carry with them a view of Irish history. When, when I went home, to my family after my first uh, term at Trinity College and, and uh, told them my new view on Irish history. It was completely dismissed as, as Trinity talk. Um, uh, but I think it's enormously important for us in Scotland and indeed in Britain generally as, as we think about how we commemorate World War I. Um, your, in, your metaphor of taking the scissors to a part of our history again really resonated with me when I was a an 18-year-old in Trinity, every Sunday I used to visit my grandparents who, who lived in Dublin, and I used to help them around the house. And, and one Sunday, I was cleaning out an old set of drawers and came across a photograph of my grandfather with his two brothers, about whom I'd known. One of them was my father's namesake. Well, there was my father's namesake in the uniform of the British Army, and that had never been mentioned in the family. And I still remember the emotion of shock and horror when I saw it, and it was almost tantamount to seeing that he'd been convicted of a sexual assault or something. Um, it was something I put, I put the photograph back, and I didn't mention it to anyone for, for years afterwards. Um, so it's so important that as we think about how we commemorate World War I in this country, that we don't leave anybody out, whether it's you know, remembering the conscientious objectors uh, doesn't in any way diminish the memory for those who fought so bravely and died. It's so important that we remember everyone, that we constantly question who it is we're not remembering, what are the questions we're not asking, who are we forgetting as we try our best to create as full a history as we can. Um, you said, President McAleese, that as you uh, left uh, Oris on Uchtaron, you turned to your husband and said, uh, I think that worked. We can assure you it certainly did on behalf of all of us. Thank you very much. <laughs>